Hey, welcome back everybody to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant. Joseph McBride with me on the desk again today. Dean at all standing by in the ether. We got a lot to cover today. Clearly one of the most confusing issues in this case, and there are a bunch of them. How did the defendant know about how the, the bodies of the children were stacked in the tub if he wasn't there? Of course, according to the defense, he could have learned it many places, his hairdresser, uh, etc. So again, very confusing for this jury. Helping us sort this out, as well as Joseph McBride here on set, I have Dina Dahl with us out of California. You're in uh, San Diego, is that right, Dina? Actually, Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Some, somewhere in that Southern Cal area. Good to have you along. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining me. You're welcome. Let Thank me ask you. you about this case. You're an attorney, but you also bring an interesting perspective to this because you you mediate things. You you resolve disputes. And in the criminal sector, that might be more like pretrial negotiations on a plea, something of that sort. But you're still evaluating facts, coming to some sort of resolution. This case is full of contradictions and conflict. Give me your thoughts on the case. Yeah, actually, I, my a huge part of doing mediation is seeing the human aspect of it. And I, I feel like the prosecution keeps on talking about the reaction of the defendant during his interview and whether or not he appropriately talks about it in that moment. And as a mediator, I actually think they're putting maybe too much of uh, emphasis on that. You'd be surprised at how people talk about their issues in a legal setting. They have many reasons for maybe showing emotion or not showing emotion or talking about extra details that are necessary or not talking about extra details that are necessary. I mean, humans are complicated. And just because he maybe didn't show the kind of emotion that they expected in that interview, I think that they are um, taking too much away from that. Yeah, and it might have had some impact on what he recalled and how he recalled those events. By the way, I'm, I'm going to apologize up front if I just say Dahl at some point. I don't want HR calling me. That's your last name. Uh, and, and, you know, I may just slip at that point. So forgive me now. It's a great name. It's like a Philip Marlowe uh, kind of story. Yeah, Google, Google Philip Marlowe. Okay, Joseph McBride in studio with me to talk about this case. And we've been following this. You've been in a, a few times as this case has unfolded. They're done now. They are done. Give me any thoughts, pro or con, for the prosecution's case, things that jump out at you. Not much jumps out, jumps out at me about this case on behalf of the prosecution. I have been a, a quite miffed since the beginning of this as to why they're trying it again. There is a mountain of evidence that is evidence to the contrary that does not support the prosecution's theory. We talked about conflict. We talked about concerns. All that amounts to reasonable doubt. I don't think they can overcome it here. One of the big questions that we've been talking about is how did the defendant know when he knew what he knew? And there was a witness that was going to corroborate really when the defense learned uh, or the defendant learned about some of the details. That was the hairdresser aspect. And they tracked her down. They wanted her to testify. The court had to deal with this mid-trial. Let's listen. Joseph McBride, uh, the judge ultimately said, no, this woman's not going to testify. This is a woman that would have been a fact witness to corroborate the defense theory that the defendant learned some of the details, not because he did the crime, but because he learned him from this hairdresser. Thoughts on not letting her testimony in? Generally a problem for the defense. Anytime that you promise that someone is going to deliver on behalf of the defense and they fail to deliver, reasonable juries infer that there's an issue here, there's a problem here. So if that's your fault somehow? Yeah, it's a strike against the defense for sure. Dina, what do you think about the appellate issue? Uh, you know, the judge has ruled that this witness cannot testify. Could be a critical witness, could be a reversible error type witness. What do you think? I agree. That's exactly the thought I just had saying that. Cooperate. I mean, this witness, her dresser, if she, can, if she testifies under oath that she was the one that told him that the children were in the bathtub, that really cuts against this prosecution's argument. I think I would definitely... If he, get, if he were to be convicted, I think that would definitely be part of an appeal. Yeah, I, I could see that in the paperwork and how powerful it might be. Depends, of course, on the totality of the circumstances. Maybe it was harmless. Maybe it was reversible. Michael Knox talking about a lot of swipes and smears of blood and spatter and all kinds of disarray. Interesting, on those last uh, couple of images there, you see the blood on the exterior of the front door. Probably somebody making a, you know, a hasty retreat, leaving a little evidence behind. Joseph, uh, the key to this guy, he's a defense witness, is really to get this jury to believe their theory that this was a, a planned hit, that it was a, you know, more than one person was involved. How do you think he did? I think he did okay. The, the important thing here is that none of the blood matches to any of the defendant's DNA. This is a who did it, 
whodunit case, right? And he's excluded from everything here. Blood all over the place, he's not involved. That's a win for me. So, Dina, what do you think about uh, you know, the, the mystery of whether it was one person, whether it was two, whether it was three, maybe the defendant had somebody helping him, although that's not been a theory posited by the prosecution. How much help is it to just lay these vague ideas on this jury? There's nothing specific as to who the other people might be from this witness. How, how, how important, how, how uh, powerful is it for this witness to just kind of lay that out there for the jury? I think it's really powerful because I do think this is going to come down to the DNA and this I they've, they've showed earlier in the trial that there was an unidentified female DNA underneath her fingernail when she was in a fight for her life and uh, if they are and then there's also another male DNA I believe on the spade next to her body which would uh, say that there was more than one person involved here so what they're trying to do today is Kind of bolster that argument. They see there's so many areas of blood. There's so much blood. This couldn't have been done by one person. Multiple people left blood around the house. I think it's strong for the defense. Yeah, of course, the prosecution would say that, hey, if it were more than one person, professionals, it would have been a cleaner crime scene. That's going to be the counter argument. Okay, I'm going to give you guys an assignment about Joseph and Dina. Think about it. No answer right now. Think about the one thing, the one most important thing that bothers you about the prosecution case, the one most important thing that bothers you about the defense case. Okay. Go ahead and work on that assignment. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to listen now to one of the guys that provided really some layering, probably most in the jury we're not familiar with, and that is criminal activity in gangs and the, the connection, if any, to this case. We just talked about the spade. Dina mentioned it. That was key to this witness's analysis. This is Mr. De La Cruz. He is a gang expert. Let's listen. So there's Dr. Jesse De La Cruz. Sorry, doctor, I left out the doctor part, doctor of uh, gangology or some very specific criminological angle there. Dina, uh, how do you like this guy? I mean, this is a, an area that I hope most people on this six-member jury don't know about. How did you like his uh, handling of the subject? No, I think he did fine. You know, the defense doesn't actually have to prove that she was a member of a drug cartel and she was skimming out money. Remember that they don't have that burden of proof. They just need to create reasonable doubt here. They are giving evidence toward their theory that she was part of the drug cartel to back up it rather than it just being doubt for a reasonable doubt. But they don't actually have to prove that fact that she was a drug cartel. So right. I think his, his, this witness is was fine. Yeah, I, I get that. And by the way, I think you were looking at my pad here because that was, I'm going to give you a, 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 a tease as to what one of my big points was. The big point, I think, for the defense that is the biggest challenge is that there hasn't been any real evidence of her involvement with drugs. Now, Joseph, obviously, they don't have to prove that. They don't. But when your core alternative suspect argument focuses on this drug issue, and the only evidence you have is Mr. Santos saying, yeah, you know, she did drug uh, running for us and she skimmed money, so we had to hit her. Is that enough? Well, you have Santos, you have the spade, you have a gruesome manner that kind of cuts both ways. On one hand, it can cut toward the defendant because it's, it looks emotional and personal. On the other hand, it can cut towards the gangs because the gangs like to make an example and it's backed up by the other corroborating evidence in this case. I still like the defense's theory here. Okay. We're going to find out how the prosecution does going after the defense reconstructionist because uh, that was critical back and forth. That took place just a few hours ago, and it will take place yet again when we come right back. This is the Long Crime Network.